Hey, this is Sule Morvina, and tune in to The Relay for the latest news in boxing all around the world. Thank you for supporting myself and other female boxers. We truly appreciate it. Welcome to the motherfucking Relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this one. The last few videos, we've been talking about Sky Sports' recent announcement, their newly formed stable of fighters. Savannah Marshall and Clarissa Shields among them. How Sky is attempting to deliver the fight that Eddie Hearn could not as a means of showing him up and sticking it to him. How that might leave Eddie Hearn feeling so inclined to make a women's super fight of his own. Perhaps the Katie Taylor versus Amandia Serrano fight. Oh. All of that jazz. But there is that much more to cover involving the other fighters. The Sky Sports Stable of Sirens. When I first heard the rumor that Savania Marshall was gonna be boxing on Sky henceforth, I also heard that Natasha Jonas would be joining her. Yet Natasha Jonas's name is missing from Sky Sports' newly formed stable of fighters. It's not there, and I don't know what that means. I don't know if they're going to make an announcement later on, if they're still working on some things, or if it's that Natasha has decided to stay with Matchroom, fight on the zone. I don't know. Because we've heard no new news in reference to Natasha Jonas on either front, on the Sky Sports side of things or the Matchroom to zone side of things. She doesn't have a fight date. I don't really know what that means. We've no confirmation at this time where it is Natasha Jonas is going to be fighting. We don't know if she's going to be boxing on Sky or she's going to continue to box under the Matchroom banner by way of DAZN. We just don't know. Keep our ears to the street! These boxing screets for any developments on that. See that they signed amateur standout Carolyn Dubois, the younger sister of Daniel Dubois, who fights for Frank Warren, old fish eyes. Took me by surprise that she ended up on the Sky Sports side of things. I did half expect her. I thought she might join him over there. No, no, she's going to be boxing on Sky, and for what it's worth, I think she made the right decision. I think Sky is the much better platform for a young female fighter that's looking to make a name for herself. And it appears that Carolyn Dubois is going to be fighting out of the lightweight division, where Katie Taylor holds all the alphabet titles. She is that division's undisputed champion. She's going to be in action this weekend in defense of all her world titles against her mandatory challenger by way of the IBF, hailing from the United States, El Paso, Texas, former IBF featherweight champion Jennifer Hahn. And look, Regardless of what happens with that fight, if Katie makes it through it the way I'm expecting her to, or by some chance Jennifer Hahn shocks the world, upsets the apple cart for Katie, regardless of what happens with that, it's gonna be a while before Carolyn Dubois... It's gonna be a while before she fights for a title. In my previous video, I talked about how those alphabet titles are the ties that bind. The ties that force a, 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 a matchroom fighter to perhaps take on a boxer fighter, a boxer that boxes on Sky. And we're not there yet. Not with Carolyn Dubois at lightweight, not with Ebony Jones at bantamweight, not with April Hunter at welterweight, not with Georgia O'Connor at super welterweight. We're not there yet. So even if Adam Smith and people over there at Boxer, people over there at Sky have aspirations of one day matching Carolyn Dubois against Katie Taylor for all the belts, assuming Katie can hang on to them that long, she doesn't move up and wait, becomes a champion someplace else, assuming that Katie is still in the lightweight division, reigning as its undisputed champion well over a year from now, because that is how long it could take, would take. It's gonna be a while before Carolyn's ready to fight for a title. A long while. A power struggle may ensue between the major platforms, Sky Sports and the zone. It might, but that power struggle won't rear its ugly head for a while. A long while at lightweight. So long as Katie Taylor reigns as the lightweight division's undisputed champion, Matchroom will have the run of the place for the foreseeable future. While Sky might have a pony in that show and Carolyn Dubois, Carolyn Dubois has a lot of catching up to do. Now, Ebony Jones, who campaigns in the bantamweight division, that's 118 pounds, she's set to make her professional debut on the undercard of Eubank Jr. versus El Beer early next month in October. She's gonna be boxing on that undercard against Beck Connolly, oh. who just got stopped by Ebony Bridges on the matchroom to zone side of things. Ebony Jones is Sky Sports pony in the show in that bantamweight division, that bantamweight scene. And the bantamweight division is a less political division than, say, the lightweight division, because in that division, Matchroom's only got 
one world champion. The other three world titles. The other three world champions ain't matchroom fighters. If by some chance, political boundary lines are drawn, tensions arise between the Sky Sports stable of fighters and the DAZN stable of fighters, Ebony Jones, you know, she ain't gotta go through Shannon Courtney to fight for a title. There's three other world champions there at this time. And even though she's not yet ready to fight for a title, and I don't think she will be for some time. She has yet to make her pro debut. It's gonna be a while before she enters into world title contention. And because Matchroom doesn't have the run of the place, there's a chance that by the time Ebony is ready to fight for a title, she won't have to go through a matchroom fighter in order to do so. Politics may not get in the way. Something very similar applies to Georgia O'Connor, who campaigns in the 154-pound division, the super welterweight division, or the junior middleweight division, as it's often referred to. The difference there is that Clarissa Shields is Georgia O'Connor's stablemate by way of Sky Sports and Boxer. In that way, most of the world titles in that division are on her side of the street. So should the day come she wants to fight for one, it's entirely feasible. And if I'm being honest, I don't know that Clarissa's gonna hang on to those belts. One of them has already become vacant, and Hannah Rankin is set to fight for it in the near future. And I could see a couple of fights down the line, a fight between Hannah and Georgia, assuming that Hannah can hang on to that WBA title, because I think she's gonna win it. George is set to make her pro debut next month on the 16th on the undercard of Huey Fury versus Christian Hammer. So she, like Carolyn Dubois, Ebony Jones, is a ways out from world title contention. But this is yet another division where Matchroom Dank got the run of the place, and because of that, political boundary lines won't cause any tensions to rise. Doesn't look like it. Won't cause friction. Because Matchroom ain't got the run of the place. There really is that much more to cover in reference to how this all might play out depending on which fighters campaign at what weights and who's holding the titles in those divisions. Very interesting times in the UK boxing scene. We will be discussing it further moving forward. In other news per tweet from Mike Coppinger via his sources, the Pasqua Yaki Tribe Athletic Commission rules Oscar Valdez can proceed with a scheduled September 10th fight versus Ramson Consecao despite positive A and B samples testing positive for the banned substance Fentermine. I got mixed feelings about this. Earlier today, news broke that the banned substance was found in both Valdez's A and B samples, according to sources, potentially jeopardizing his WBC 130-pound title defense against Robson Consecao on September 10th. And you know, both the A and B samples were taken the same day. So if the A sample tells you that there's something present in this guy's system, the B sample's gonna tell you the same thing because they were collected the same day. Oh. A separate sample was taken on August 30th that tested negative for Fetamine. By that time, the drug had left his system. Because the half-life of the banned substance is roughly 20 hours. It takes five to six half-lives for Fetamine to leave the system, maximum of five days. That negative test came 17 days after the positive. There was always a gray area associated with this situation because of WADA's protocols. Fentermine is a banned substance on the WADA banned list, but that's only in competition. The day of the fight... Any post-fight testing that ensues. And because Oscar Valdez's positive samples were collected so far out from the actual fight, they don't meet WADA's protocols for banned substances in competition. Oscar Valdez samples they took from him on the 13th, he wasn't in competition on the 13th. Listen, that might be why the Pasquayaki tribe decided to let the fight go through. Because the banned substance is only a banned substance in competition, at least based on WADA's protocol. As opposed to VADA's? Well, VADA usually mirrors WADA. They usually adhere to their protocols. There were some discrepancies there, though ultimately, VADA does not adjudicate. VADA doesn't have teeth. They don't dispense punishments per se. If anybody had the power to call this thing off, it wasn't Vada, it was the Pasqua Yaki tribe, the local commission. And when Billy Joe Saunders tested positive for that Flonay stuff, it wasn't Vada that called the fight off, it was the Massachusetts commission that called it off, because they've got the teeth to do so. And, you know, something similar applies here. It's up to the commission. I reiterate, Vada does not adjudicate. They report their findings and alert the affected parties, and that's it fighters and their teams and the local commission and what the commission decides to do with that information that's up to them in this situation they've given the fight the green light and i think it's because the night of the fight so long as oscar stays away from those herbal teas based on a sample collected on the 13th he wouldn't walk into that fight on september 10th 
with the drug still in his system. The banned drug, the banned substance that's only banned in competition. Oh. So long as that drug's not present when he's in there with Robson Conseil. It's all water under the bridge and change under the couch cushions. I have mixed feelings about the whole thing I do because regardless of what the commission decided to do for Oscar Valdez and his reputation, the damage is done. And the candor of Victor Conti. You were listening. This is a performance enhancing drug that has more benefits to it than just being able to control your weight. Victor Conti, the performance enhancing drug expert. If you go by what Victor Conti said, even if Oscar Valdez takes a whole fuck ton of tests from here on out, he's already received the benefit of this fentermine drug. He doesn't need to take it anymore. He may not have to. And it looks a lot like this is just a slap on the wrist. It looks a lot like the Pasqua Yankee tribe has given Oscar the green light to cheat. That's how people are going to interpret this. That's how Sonny Edwards and Mike Kopinger are interpreting it. Several others. I mean, what are you supposed to say? It seems to me that boxing itself as a sport doesn't know how it wants to feel about doping and anti-doping. It can't seem to make up its mind. That's why I'm ambivalent. From Jean Pascal test positive for all those drugs to Ray Vargas to Jarrell Miller to more recently Oscar Valdez. I mean, the list goes on. People pick and choose when they want to be mad about it. It's what it feels like. When a Massachusetts commission didn't allow Billy Joe Saunders to compete because he tested positive for that Flonase, the Pasqua Yankee tribe... They're letting the show go on. The fans themselves, they can't seem to make up their minds. They pick and choose when they want to be bothered by this. They pick and choose when they want to be outraged. Myself, well, I'll tell you this much. I didn't buy into Tyson Fury's wild boar story when he tested positive for Nandrolone or Luis Ortiz's wild horse meat story when he tested positive for the same drug. I mean, I don't buy into the convenient explanations we often hear when these things happen. I never do. In that way, I keep the same energy for Oscar Valdez's herbal tea alibi that I kept for Jarrell Miller's penis pill story. Sounds like bullshit. I don't care if he used to go to school with Oscar, or he's your next door neighbor, or you fly the same flag as that guy. None of that shit means both fucking deadly to me. Near as I can tell, he's part of a long list of guys that got caught while they were on something. Simple as. Finally, Bob Arum had this to say in reference to the upcoming Canelo Alvarez, Caleb Plant, undisputed title tilt. He says, PBC are risking big on Canelo versus Plant. November 6th. Aram told the WBN that the reason he believes the PBC are willing to negotiate for the fight between WBO welterweight champion Terence Crawford and Sean Porter is that they're pouring so much money into paying the purses for Canelo vs. Plant's fight on November 6th, they don't want to take on an additional burden right now with the Crawford-Porter fight. When they look at this situation, they have a tremendous amount that they've bet on the Canelo fight. And to take on a burden like this, an additional burden, it's not easy. So that may be one of the reasons why they may opt for us to do the event. There are 50 fucking million dollars in combined prices between just Canelo Alvarez and Caleb Plant alone. In order to clear those kind of guarantees, this thing has to sell a minimum of 625,000 pay-per-view buys at a time where Manny Pacquiao failed to crack 300,000 pay-per-view buys. That's right. Even Manny Pacquiao's star power is waning. They need to sell 625,000 pay-per-view buys just to cover the 50 million in guaranteed purses for Canelo and Caleb. That's not counting all the other operational costs. They're gonna have to sell well in excess of 625,000 pay-per-view buys before they even start making money. And who's promoting this thing? Because Matchroom isn't. The Hamanites were all celebrating that Eddie Hearn, he's not the lead promoter for this fight, neither is Matchroom. So who's gonna do it, Tom Brown? How much experience does Tom Brown have promoting an event of this size, these kinds of guaranteed purses, a fighter of Canelo Alvarez's stature? Is he equipped to do this? I think the biggest event that Tom Brown's had to promote in recent memory was the rematch between Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, pre-COVID, pre-COVID of course. The guaranteed purses, the sum total of them to both Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, came to a whopping $60 million. But that time, he did have the assisted aid of Bob Arum and Top Rank, lest we forget. That was a co-promotional fight co-promoted between Top Rank and the PBC. And that was a box office flop. They overshot it that time. They overshot it with those two guys. 
guaranteeing them that kind of money? They wasn't good for it, and they didn't bring it back. Tom Brown promoted the first fight as well. Top Rank wasn't involved that time, though that time, the guarantees to the fighters, they were much smaller, thus easier to cover. This fight, you're talking about $50 million in guaranteed purses. You've got to promote the hell out of this thing, and you don't have Eddie Hearn help you. I guess the saving grace for this fight is Canelo Alvarez's star power, and that star power, it will be put to the test. Canelo Alvarez, who was just voted the most marketable male athlete in all of sports based on his metrics, his following. He moves the needle. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know that Tom Brown and the people over there at the PBC, I don't know that they're actually equipped to handle orchestrating an event for a fighter of Canelo Alvarez's stature. The St. Javante Davis or Errol Spence Jr. you're dealing with. I say it all the time. Those guys are small potatoes. Every single last one of them. You ain't gotta worry about giving one of them $40 million up front, orchestrating what is a little over a $50 million fight. The last time you tried to do this, the last time you tried to put a fight on this size, you lost money. I should have just sent Caleb across the street. I should have let the zone do the fight. Would have come at no additional cost to me and you, and the zone would have been fully capable of financing a guarantee to Canelo Alvarez's liking. As it stands, the PBC made their bed. Now they have to lie in it. Unless we forget, that's not the only quote-unquote big fight they're going to be putting on this fall. There's also the Wilder vs. Fury trilogy. The third installment. The third fight. So perhaps Bob Arum is right. They can't afford to make any other commitments at this time. Too much of their resources. Too much of their money. It's all tied up trying to pay Canelo Alvarez simultaneously trying to put on that third Wilder vs. Fury fight. And I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm not going to be presumptuous. I ain't got the foggiest fucking idea what Canelo Alvarez vs. Caleb Plant is going to do in the postmodern pay-per-view market. Because the market just ain't what it used to be post-COVID. You know, I feel like Canelo Alvarez vs. Caleb Plant on the back of Canelo's star power, it could, should definitely outperform any of Javante Davis's pay-per-views, you know, the one with Leo Santa Cruz, the more recent one with Mario Barrios. I think it'll do better than Spence vs. Danny Garcia. I think it'll do better than Pacquiao vs. Ugas. But will it break even? That's a different question. Can Canelo Alvarez do in excess? of 625,000 pay-per-view buys with a dance partner that has no profile. It's all on Canelo to sell the fight. Because Caleb Plant's not a star. He ain't got the buzz around him now that Gennady Golovkin had a couple of years ago when he fought Canelo Alvarez. I don't know.